Okay. Good. Hello, good. everybody. Hello, Kanto. Everyone Hello. looking all good? Um, today, we're going to have Kanto's second lecture, um, continuing from last week. We're um, expecting him to show us his own works this time. So we're really looking forward to it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Kanto, for um, spending time for us. Uh, all over to you. OK. Um, were, you, were you not, were there some questions from last week to talk about? Or? Not yet, but no. I thought maybe it's better that we just like get everything together and then shove it off to you. OK. Um, right now, I think with this lecture, it just I couldn't really see any, I couldn't really like make an ending to it. So it might just go on and then you might have to stop me in between. Um, but let me just uh, try this sharing thing again. Uh, one second. Does that work? Yes, it works. I can see it. Okay. It just says on the methods of abstract form finding. And if that's what you see, just a white screen and some letters. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, continuing from the lecture from last week. And last week was about precedence and the movements of abstract and architecture in the 20th century. And this week, I would like to talk about what type of work I've been interested in uh, in terms of like experimenting. And I'm going to basically only talk about what we did in Mexico which was a workshop happened started in 2014 and uh, it's been on hold since 2017 because um, we we taught we taught between three people who all of all of them we all studied at the AA school in London but over the time we started getting busy with our, with our own work so this whole workshop thing has been sort of on hold and hopefully we can get back to it. Um, anyways, um, I'd like to sort of introduce, imagine like as if I'm taking you guys through the workshop or you guys joining the workshop, but obviously it's quite hard to do that right now. So I just wanted to give you a like gr grips of what the workshop is about. And then I would like to further talk about the execution, such as what, how, what we did with materials and what we did with making things and what kind of shapes we were trying to make and how we tried to execute these things and to even to take it to an exhibition at the end. And so first of all, I would, I'm going to introduce you to where the site was, where our workshop took place. So. Our workshop was uh, based in Mexico. Um, sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. This is a little bit. I'm really sorry about this. I'll be back, right back with you. Okay, so, oh, sorry. Mm 
Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so first of all, um, the site was called Las Posas, which were, which locates in northeastern part of Mexico, and. Uh, we the workshop was uh, happened over the course of three to four weeks and uh, starting in mexico city participants of our workshop first considered constructions of sculpture sculptural nature so we tried to take the students around mexico city to show what i actually mentioned a few of the sculptural work that i showed last week like the ones from matthias Guritz. And there is, and also trying to introduce to the the actual history of Mexico, so taking everyone through the history of uh, Aztec culture, and then through the modernism, and then how how um, how Matthias Gerritz tried to bring back some emotional parts and try to make him again like uh, make art closer to architecture. And then we took the students to this place, which is called Las Posas. Um, it's a surrealist garden, which was constructed between 1945 to 1980. Almost the site took 30 years to be built. Um, it was actually never finished. And uh, this is the sort of broad picture of how the site looks like um it's kind of hard to tell but my if you can see my mouse this is the river it locates on a very steep hill and uh, and the compound is is a very rather big site and the site had some um, cabins inside where the students could stay and uh, we also had a workshop site where the students were able to build and the rivers were able, like basically um, their swimming pools, so students had chances to take a ba bath every now and then to just refresh their minds and so forth. Um, the garden was built by Edward James, this um, English eccentric per se, but he was also from the royal family, so he had a um, tremendous amount of wealth but also he was kind of free from the du uh, royal duties. So he was very much in the arts movement in the, in the 50s, uh, more from, from the 30s to the 50s. And for instance, this image on the left is a um, portrait by Magritte, and which is actually the portrait, um, which the character is actually of Edward James. Um, Edward James was very known for being the pat patron of the surrealist art movement and he was so there from Magritte but also he was also paying a lot of money to Dali to paint some pictures for him but also he was very uh, sort of committed to the art movement at that time and this is his him later in years in the place in Las Posas so just to talk, talk to you the brief history of Las Posas, basically, so during the war, Edward James was in America and he was driving around with his Cadillac and one time he reached Mexico. And in Mexico, he found a beautiful jungle, a jungle where he, he thought he can be as far away from the royal, royal family and the sort of English aristocrat sort of setting where he wanted to open up his own sort of utopia, which was all influenced by the surrealist movements. And he was always on the patron side, but at some point he wanted to start creating by himself. And this is a sort of image. This is the image of the mountain that he found, or maybe as close as to the image when, when, it was, when he visited. And uh, this, is what it turned out and this is a picture from 2010 so uh, 2014 so a lot of things happened on the site so basically what he did initially um he wanted to plant orchids in the mountain so he, and he wanted to make a flower garden but he also wanted to bring in he was very much in love with animals so he wanted to make a zoo for himself 
And over the time he was, you know, it took about 10 years to make his zoo and the flower garden. But over the time there was a really cold winter one time where all the orchids he planted had died. And after, from that point onwards, he started building um, more in the architectural sense. He wanted to build something a more perpetual and he wanted to sort of, well, make a flower garden, but he wanted, he, he was building everything. Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know, lost words, I'm sorry. He was he was trying to build a garden or reminiscent of a garden in order to sort of commemorate his orchid plantation. And um, this is the sort of one area of his site is decided. I mean, his this architecture piece is incredible. Everything works, almost works like an architecture. There's stairs, slabs, columns. But there's no particular sense of rooms or it's everything is just a uh, space. And he wanted to provoke an emotional response to people who go there. And it's, it's for us when we visit, there's a sense of excitement, but also confusion. It doesn't really tell us what it is. And we feel like a child again to and we we got so we, this effect of feeling like a child again and being let loose in the place was something we wanted to sort of share to the students and um, get inspired by these structures in the park and to start making things on their own. Talking about the history of the site, the site basically Edward James was never an architect. So what he did, he he brought and his idea was very grand so what he did he he hired oh um, i think nearly a thousand carpenters so basically over 30 years every day there was about 40 carpenters building something on the site and these are his sketches so as you can tell he barely had a sense of three-dimensional um, articulation or but he had fairly something concrete in his mind, which was to, which was to kind of make um, these natural objects or objects that are in, heavily inspired by nature. And he wanted to, uh, he, he had this uh, process of abstracting these objects and he, he made these sketches. And what he did, he just handed these sketches to the craftsman in Mexico, 80% of the buildings are built by, uh, well, DIY. So what it is, what that means is basically Mexican people really know how to build things. It doesn't really need to go through the hands of architects. So he, in that sense, he was very lucky. So he just handed, he just needed to hand the, these people could then just decipher the sketches and start making these things in reality. Most of the things were built in concrete, it was cheap and available material, but also um, it was also uh, very rigid in order to, uh, it, was, it was very easy to maintain and it was very easy to build uh, on top of each other. So it was suited for like a project in this type, which like, you know, 30 years, things getting built on the top of each other without so much of structural engineering. Um, and this, I mean, I'm just showing you how these things were built at that time. You can see the reinforcement bar sticking out and how, how the formworks were being attached to these structures. And you can see on the left uh, how Edward James is having a chat with the carpenter about this formwork. You can see on the left, I mean, on the bottom left, which this is one of the formworks on the, for the columns on the right. Um, so anyways, it's, it's a very beautiful park and the sculptures were just something really interesting types of in terms of how they were being built and how they were being how they were standing and also very refreshing to see that they have not so much of an architectural purpose but more of a sculptural presence
I would like to, I would really like to show you like a whole video about this park, but actually that's not my intention why I'm showing you these images, but you just get the image of what kind of place this was. So every, it's, it's, it's a very, uh, it's in the highlands and uh, it's in a rainforest most of the season, I think, and 70% of the season it's raining there. So the plantations are strong. So the foliage, like the plants and the roots, they, they, all, they have overgrown the sculpture park over the time. And now I think it's at the perfect state. Everything is crumbling. The concrete are just about standing because there's so many landslides. But then the, I think in essence, this is some kind of like, uh, Edward James never thought this project was finished. But I think at this time now, it's finally come to a phase where we can kind of understand that this thing can be just, well, it's at this point, it's, the site is all about preservation rather than building more. So I have, in my opinion, I think the whole project is finished, but now it's about how to preserve this feeling when you reach the place. And I really recommend if anybody has a chance to go to Mexico, please go visit this place. It's a very, very beautiful thing. Um, Looking at the plans and elevation, there's something very interesting. Um, well, I would say this, I mean, it's kind of obvious because it's through that when the time Nicole Bizier was um, mentioning about Maison Domino, uh, I mean, this, this idea came from, um, from, from the emergency of concrete, uh, emergence of concrete. And until then, a lot of buildings were built with thick walls, but with the available concrete and with architectures were, um, so, so buildings were became easy to build because they just needed, to, needed some columns and then the slabs and staircases, so fast constructions. And um, so in a way that it was quite interesting to find out that this surrealist garden had some kind of relevance to the modern architecture um, techniques. And uh, when we first found this place, we were very captured by how these things were built, but also um, we were very captured by the feelings of the site, but we were also quite interested in how. And uh, this how was somehow maintained in the place. And so we, I'll show you later, all the formworks works were kept in one storage and we were lucky enough to find those formworks and to study them. And I'm just showing you still the images of the drawing. Um, the, the, these drawings were drawn later by some, um, some researchers. So they're not quite, um, they're not from, from the 40s or 50s but you get, kind of get the sense. So um, we took the students first into this hotel where there was the, the, where the formworks were being kept for the um, Las Posas. This hotel was very close in the nearing um, village. And then we first took the students and showed these formworks. And the formworks were all built out of wood and nails. Obviously, from in that time, there was, I think everything was built manually. And there's already these formworks had a very interesting sense of aesthetics. And um, what we wanted to do was to let the students read into these formworks, because some of the formworks, I talk about formworks, I don't know, maybe am I rushing? But like formworks are basically the formworks to pour the concrete in. Um, formworks can be made out of wood, they can also be dug out from earth. They're, so as long as there's some kind of form that retain, that can sh form a space inside that can be called formwork. So this is, this is what just one of the few formworks that like, Edward James has used. And we took the students, showed them the storage, and well you can see it's like very intricate um some of the formats that you you almost have no idea how they're even used it's almost interesting as just objects and um, 
what we wanted to tell the students it is about this play between negative and positive. So in, in the negative space, we put, put a concrete in and then make a positive out of it. So this talk between the formwork and concrete was always quite interesting for us. And sometimes just to make the formwork sometimes start to have some kind of a, um, sculptural quality. And some, I guess some carpenters try to make the remaining pieces of a formwork into some kid children toys. And that was also something very interesting, but also told us a lot about how we, how these formworks can be applied in this sort of as objects as well. Um, so the students went through and analyzed objects. Um, so we made this, we grouped the students between, well, most of the times, three a free group and let them analyze uh, these pieces. And to, to mention again, these students has, have never seen the site yet. So they really don't know what they expect, what they have to expect. So they were slowly trying to come up with how these things were used. Some students started drawing axonometrics and um, this process was very important to us, which, which we call the uh, process of abstraction. So you find an object in front of you and then start to think what it can, what it can produce, produce from it. So we start, try to pull things out, dissect them, or even start to think about in three dimension how these things can be reapplied. And uh, this is another group that they were trying to just simply analyze what the shape is like of the formwork and how they're being built. And then they start to think about what these, what the concrete piece inside would look like. And over the time, when as they start drawing, the drawing starts to translate by itself into something else. And then in, the, in these moments, students find something very beautiful. And uh, we try to embrace those moments. Those, like, those moments where people found it either beautiful or something very, I don't know, uh, um, useful. Or if, if somebody found any purpose in it, we let them sort of pose the moment and then start to think further in those, about those moments rather than the objects where they started from. And also we, try, we encourage all the students to really take good pictures of the models. Because even these, I think, um, it's, it, um, it looks like a very simple model, like cut styrofoam. But if you really put like an, just a simple white background and take a really nice picture, they start to sort of lose I mean, in this case, we took it in black and white, so it loses the sense of materiality. So in that way, it kind of loses a sense of scale as well. And once the scale, sense of scale is lost, these things become almost inhabitable. I mean, you can almost scale yourself and place yourself somewhere, and then you can almost submerge yourself in these pictures. And this group i mean i'll show you how the trajectory was for this group just quickly and just go i go back to a few slides so they started from this triangular formwork they analyzed it in shapes and the shapes started to form sort of change by itself and they started playing around with these shapes took some very beautiful pictures and then now they really wanted to make these pieces in concrete and all, and actually what they did is they initially wanted to make these shapes in concrete, but then they used these shapes to create a piece of concrete. So you can see here how, they, how it's been used as a formwork. And then this is the outcome. And then it, by multiplying the objects, they start to be able to play with a few uh, compositions and they were able to do these things. And so like you can kind of roughly see the trajectory of how a very simple piece of, uh, well, how this object, a formwork object has translated itself into a completely new piece of object. Um, this is another case, another girl was looking at these three connected barrels looking formworks. 
and she was analyzing them, trying to see what could be inside, trying to see what could be inside. Still so many, so many sketches. And I mean, these sketches don't, didn't really need to be accurate. It was, just, it was about just trying to experiment or just trying to research or, how, or just trying to come up with a way of method of research. So we didn't really sort of force the students to kind of come up with beautiful drawings. It was more about trying to try as many options as possible. And what we always said is just take beautiful pictures. Again, this is a very simple piece of model, but in the, it's, it's, it has some kind of beautiful um, aspect to it. It's, it's almost, I mean, there's one about the scale, but there's also this conversation between what is the negative or what is the positive in this sense. And um, so, and then she started scaling it up and then she's still thinking about what the shape can be, what what the shape is like for the formwork, what a piece of concrete is like. Um, but over the time, she get she got more concerned about these you know, structures that sort of retain the formwork. So it became less about the form, but she wanted to sort of explore what can hold the formwork. There's some other pictures from another group. Again, it's about just nailing how good a picture you can take and these things can take yourself uh, take take a project very far in my opinion um yeah then and, and it goes on and some students just took um a very simple diagram and these it's, it's a very simple drawing um exercise but these things if you play right with them i think there's something very beautiful and like, and you can pick almost in any moments and to advance some something into something more um, three dimensional. Okay, um, so this first exercise was about trying to come up with shapes and trying to understand what form how formworks are being used. And until then, the students have never seen the structures, and then. All of a sudden, one day we take the students into the site, the Las Posas garden. And in the garden, we were lucky to have some workshop areas where we could stay and make things. And in this, for, the, for this place, which is called the Carpintera, which we used as a workshop for the carpenters in the site. And we were, we were using the site to sort of further develop our three-dimensional research. We were trying, we were making models. Again, we, it's in the jungle and there were almost no shops around it. The closest is a, in a village where there's about 2000 people in there. So imagine like how limited the resources are. So what we took from Mexico City was all we had practically. Um, I mean, the wire cutter is a little bit advanced in this image, but um, everything else, we, we are mostly using cardboards or simple plastic pieces. So we no digital manufacturing, but that, that sort of restriction on us, sort of going primitive and rudimentary, also was something very important for us to come so to incorporate in our design method. Um, so you can kind of see how the students are working here. And then after a while, once we were, uh, after a while we studied forms and shapes, it was time for us to start making form works. I mean, the limited time for us, it was only three weeks and then the amount of time that it takes to cast something in concrete and also calculating the amount of mistakes that might happen in between. It was a very short workshop and uh, I, there was a lot of work involved. Um, I would, so let's, let's say, I think there's barely no time for us to rest or to just sightsee. So the swimming pools in the side was very important for us. So we can occasionally just, just really have a fresh head. Um, 
so this was the workshop that we had on another area of the site which was actually used as a coffee plantation uh, coffee drying area in the 40s and the 50s and we took it over and we put some simple structures put some sheds and we started make, trying to we started getting on with our work well, so going back to the sort of material testing phase or trying to start the material testing phase in these scales well, basically our workshop was our agenda in our workshop was create objects in the sense that we can carry it back to Mexico City to exhibit. So big, um, we didn't have to carry these objects uh, with, um, I don't know, uh, with cranes and such. And everything was in a kind of conceivable size. And with these size of objects, we are quite lucky. So in these size of objects, it's quite rather quite like rather easy to test with materials. I think any in any kind of project, even in architecture scale, I think it's quite interesting to start in a small scale or like something quite portable. And in that sense, you can kind of test um, sort of different materialities and just really go about what kind of um, finish that you want to have. Uh, we can really do test. And um, so in this first phase, we were try trying to just see how concrete reacts with colors or materials in the nature. It's almost like cooking. There's, there are some strict um, guidelines on how to use concrete, but then at some point you realize those guidelines are just for buildings and then like once you set yourself sort of once you once you can disassociate concrete from buildings and as just like consider plainly as a sculptural material then it's quite interesting how much you can do with it so for instance you can just put a lot of pigments to just change the color and so that's really simple but you can also mix uh, plants different types of metal or stones and you can also see the, the different kind of reaction that concrete has with different materials. And we encourage students to all come up with these small test samples, which we were able to use over the years as samples, because obviously the more samples there is, the easier it is to come up with a um, concrete proposal. Um, there's some other students' works in terms of uh, samples um so here this was more about the mixture but here the students tested how how watery can concrete be in order to set itself and um, the student tested with pigments so uh, how he can make gradation gra gradational the ch change in colors or more like showing in a strata basis on the right and um, we also try to make an homage to the um, sculpture park of the Mexican um, UNAM University. But also, you know, just to try to archive samples is some, sometimes quite important because um, trying to be able to access something that you've thought before is, um, is a very important process. And, uh, you, Obviously, we couldn't leave it like this, but I think there was some kind of um, hint for us what to do with samples in the future. I think this is still kind of influencing my work as well. So I'm trying, for instance, I'm using all my concrete samples as um, um, tiles for my terrace. So um, as no normally they're tiles, but when I flipped in, it shows all the mixture ratio and everything. Um, I think it's quite useful, just just the thought. And um, sort of talking about the primitive and the rudimentary and basic, again, you can see how basic the workshop is. We barely had any electronic materials. Um, 
people people are just it was a very hot place and it rains all the time and, and you know at some point it just becomes very almost um, a spiritual process of to a, a conversation between you and the concrete and people start to get naked or um and not well they just, it just looks like you know almost like maybe maybe a time when the aztec people were trying to build, build their pyramids uh, but it is something similar to what we are trying to achieve and trying to put people in a situation where there's no uh, in, in civilizational influences and just trying to just confine yourself in this very beautiful garden and just coming up with shapes and trying to experiment with shapes. So um, with the experimentation process, um, first we didn't really encourage anybody to just start making the shapes straight away so once we had the samples being built we started we started letting people think about how concrete can be cast and some some students were trying to experiment with very big um, so concrete is usually mixed with sand and gravel and cement and a little bit of water um, and sand is quite important because it compacts the concrete but you know, some people just try to use cement and gravel and try to see what kind of effect that makes and so forth so, so a lot of people are trying to just maximize what um, available methods are and so these are some samples you can probably see so this was one of the this was the one that we that I just showed you before and you can see how people are trying to test with colors as well and some people are trying to test with what how what kind of form works we can make so this was all um, cladded with ropes and it was quite interesting how the effect came out it's almost like a snake skin that, uh, that comes out as a result and this is just somebody trying to use very thin pieces of ply stuck together almost starts to look like a fabric and there's some beauty in it that we all wanted to um, um <clears throat> we wanted to take it further and this for instance is a very badly cast concrete mix but then again in the sense of sculpture in the sense of scaled model this these sort of failures can be translated into something as some kind of aesthetic that you know you can maybe appropriate in a bigger scale as a material or like a look and feel that <clears throat> in this case in this scale it might be a mistake or badly made decision but in a bigger scale it might actually start to influence a very good decision um, grinding concrete is also something that we wanted to test a lot because I don't know if all of you heard um, Terrasso. Terrasso is pretty much grinded concrete. Um, and it's, it's really not that difficult. You, once you cast a concrete, you just grind it through. And, but however, the, with the different types of gravels that you mix inside, you totally get different kind of effects. And these are the type of um, material testing we encourage students to do. Um, one girl even went completely primitive. She took a machete and started carving into a big piece of log. And then these, these were the sort of formwork pieces that she came, out, came up with. Another student had something very simple in his mind, which was he wanted to make um, arch a, a shape of an arch but in a sort of very orthogonal shape and um, in order to achieve the simple shape we encouraged him to come up with a very complicated um, formwork which can be opened up like a window maybe uh, or it can the assembly of the former can be quite interesting yeah. and maybe it's you know, trying to come up with something simple we we try to overcomplicate the process and try to see what um, the outcomes can be through that um, these are the drawings that he saw and the, in his head and then so after casting the concrete it's almost the formwork can become like a 
clothing for the concrete piece. So often in this scale, formworks can be used very well as a um, transportation tool. So to protect a piece of concrete, uh, often formworks are used to just protect the concrete. But in this case, it was more about this um, garment that goes around the concrete. So sometimes you can take it all apart or sometimes you can leave some parts on it just to, s to add some aesthetic value to the simple piece of concrete. And then these, you know, so he was trying to come up with sort of joineries using all other words. So just trying to be as, sim as primitive and as simple as possible in terms of like the materials that he, he used. And then this was the process where he was casting the piece. It's quite difficult to make an airtight formwork. So you, as you can see, the concrete's already seeping out from the, all the gaps. So in order to counter, well, in order to contain the concrete inside, he used a lot of clamps and ropes together just to hold it together. But also at some point we realized, okay, this is something quite interesting because now there's a concrete piece inside and the formwork is attached, but somehow the complicated state of the formwork doesn't quite reveal what's inside. You know, some people, if I look at this piece, it's almost like, okay, there's something quite complex inside. But in reality, this very this is just a piece of simple concrete, and so we wanted to sort of leave the mystery of what's inside this this um, this question that I mentioned from the last lecture. So, as as I told you before, like we try to take the objects to Mexico to exhibit in an exhibition, and this is one of the pieces how we exhibited it. Sort of, it's just a formwork with a hidden concrete inside. But I think there's some value to it. It just poses a question to the people, and, and a question about what is the positive and what is the negative. Again, this is another model. This is actually something I made. Um, so I had no kind of idea as to what I was going to use this for. I just wanted to carve a beautiful hole into the wood. So again, um, the, our workshop was pretty much the conversation about the wood and the concrete. And uh, often the formwork is delivered by wood or we are limited by wood. But so I was just trying to come up with how, just trying to come up with like beautiful shapes of wood. And hopefully that, um, how that piece of wood can inf inform a formwork. And in this case, I just tried to carve a really, really beautiful hole, like just trying to make the wood look like a fluid piece of object. And then after this was um, appropriated, per se, I used the pieces of wood and added some plywood around it so it can become a formwork and I poured the concrete in and it just became a negative inverted version of the pieces of wood. I, another in another case, this was already at the exhibition gallery, but in in, in this case, we used try to this was I think was for the one of the last pieces, and we needed to add some pieces to the exhibition, and in, in this process, we used the concrete as a formwork. So I'll show you now. It's basically using the concrete. We put a concrete right on top of it. It's nothing that complicated. And then this is the outcome of it. It it becomes quite interesting how you know once you use wood and you pour the concrete in, and then the concrete as and usually the concrete is the final piece of work, but then you use the concrete again to cast something. It be, becomes this infinite play between what is the formwork or what is the actual piece and you don't you kind of lose the sense of the negative and the positive which again i'm talking about you know the negative can be the space sometimes but sometimes the space itself is the construct and with the with the continuation of spaces you try to achieve a bigger effect and this is a something this is some idea that we try to play around with in another case, this is um, 
uh, a method called slipcast. And in the method of slip casting is it's it's like a scaled model of how you build um, high rises. I mean, I might be far fetching, but this is like you start to cast from bottom upwards and you slide up the hollow piece upwards. And in this way, you can start to achieve a certain construction like look. And we try to pile these things up and then it's, you know, we wanted to somehow try with modular pieces that can go up and maybe almost leaving the top part empty. So there's a sort of sense of unfinished, the sense of um, unlimitedness. Um, these are some sketches from the students. Again, we didn't even use computers. So it was almost quite hard to maintain the sort of sketches because it rains all the time so like the drawings become like the, the drawings had to be fixed all while we were trying to use the drawings so the drawings started to add some layers on top and that was also something quite interesting trying to trying to maintain these things that you build around it or sometimes by fixing something you find some gap or you find something interesting that happens in between and then from there you start to further develop the project and you know these mistakes like even I, I wouldn't call it a mistake but these accidents we tried to take it quite seriously and uh, so this this is the outcome of the sketch I just showed you before this um, modular continuous concrete columns um this is another this is i think this is also for the modular pieces and this is another group that we're trying to sort of um stack the object in the helix form and this is as you can see is such a complex formwork it's really hard to tell what to, what it comes out of and this, this is actually the outcome of it and it can be stacked up in an infinite way there's another group maybe maybe i'm sure okay uh, sorry okay anyway so this was the i mean i just rushed through the works that we did um in the site in Las Posas, but we took the excellent pieces back to a gallery called Massa Galleria at the end. And um, again, I was talking about archiving and how to show objects and how to like making them accessible again. So like, in, it's not necessary that we're just trying to come up with beautiful shapes, but also it was a type of, we're trying to make it type of an archive where we can again juxtapose these shapes together and try to come up with something. And in order for in order to do that, we needed a lot of models and experiments and uh, trying to archive these things, trying to make these things um, um, exhibitable with some, uh, this was almost the most important part, part of the workshop. Um, I show you just a few images of how the exhibitions were done. This is one of the first exhibitions. So this was more like an archaeological exhibition, which which we call the archaeological in the sense that we it's just laid out in categories and shapes and forms, and not so much uh, to explain the um, context of it, but more about how these things can trying to let people understand how these shapes were being made uh, or just to pose some question how what these shapes can be uh, interpreted as and with the columns we try to uh, um, we tr try to place them in a sort of organization where these shapes can start to create the spaces around them um, that the the spaces inside them can be the interesting part of it. So we try to make a room with these columns in a sense that the col and these columns were hinting that they, were, they, they can be built infinitely and then in 
so as people walk around in this exhibition, people feel the unfinishedness, but also this void which can be built in towards and these sort of spaces with questions or like the unfinishedness was something that we wanted to put, um, achieve. This again was the sort of objects that we come up came up with. Often the objects don't really necessarily talk to each other, but we try to locate them in the sort of sense that it can maybe talk about the cityscape or some some utopian city. And the the sort of placement of these objects and the, the conversation that those objects have is something that we wanted to quite look into. Anyways, um so that was actually it um i'm sorry that this um this was yeah that's all the images i'm sorry like i think i, I under talked i think i was only talked for 15 minutes or something but uh i hope no. you got the idea. no you did it fine <laughs> <laughs> On time, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank well, you very much. These are gorgeous. I mean, it, the images all really make us really happy. You know, it yeah. just gives me a smile. <laughs> it's like watching little lovely kids. Um, so lovely, these colors. I mean, for the color pigments, did you get it from nature or did you actually use some artificial inks? We used uh, a lot of artificial inks because there's a limited amount of time. Obviously, mm -hmm. the nature also allows to give you on the F little mm -hmm. bit. And uh, concrete actually needs a lot of pigments to yeah. make them a different color. But we also used um, brass powder and copper powder. Apple powder, and right, these, okay. Yeah. And these things can change, uh, do something to the concrete quite interesting over the time, mm. not right away, but with the on aging of the brass and copper, the mm -hmm. concrete starts to change into like a little bit like green, brown. Mm. And these things were conceivable after a year or so. So like, you know, obviously these things age over the time and they start to show different kind of you know, texture to you. And this is also something quite interesting, what concrete lets or allows. Yeah, so. Um, the was, Edward James's, these vertical structures, uh, are they all 100% hmm. concrete? Yes, they're all 100% they concrete. Things. Did yeah. he use they any actually, reinforcements inside? Yes, they use reinforcement and they are actually over reinforced. You usually oh. double amount of reinforcement that I actually needs. Obviously, oh. as I said, these pieces were built by local, they are not even carpenters, but just local people with a very good knowledge of Tools. architecture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, these people were obviously, I mean, they they were self-taught and mm -hmm. you know as you, when you self-teach yourself you kind of go safe on things quite often mm -hmm. and and also build their own houses so they've been through some mistakes and i think those kind of um understanding of architecture the basic understanding of architecture allowed these pieces to exist and also in such a long span of time i think otherwise it, it would have been in pieces it was mm -hmm. if it was built with the yeah. minimum requirements yeah beautiful i mean it was very inspiring especially when you showed us the model of from you know the the study which became the positive and then became the negative and another positive you know mm -hmm. going through that process it was wonderful it was really inspiring it's not necessarily the most intriguing in terms of the the shape or the aesthetics but i think this is what this is what we are trying to teach to the mm -hmm. students this sort of conversation between what is the positive and what is the negative what it, what is it that you know yeah you what it means into, into mm. form, form making yeah so 
and or where you pose the end of a creation you know where 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 do you end a thing or well, when do you say what when is it finished and these mm. kind of things is you know you, you just have to keep trying and and somehow just go sometimes a little bit further than you are comfortable with mm. you know and it, it, it takes a little bit of just you know it, it, people are confused super confused they really don't know where to stop or what, what to make only the time passes and then you know <laughs> but then these documentations can be a very strong tool mm -hmm. to justify what you've done and by you know this is i'm just trying to t tell you in chronological order but you can also almost fake by you know changing some orders of it and mm -hmm. th that is not really we don't you know we don't scold people for like falsifying this um, process of making i think sometimes can something gets built much faster but then you need to justify a t the shape of it and then you start to experiment again and I, th I think this is a constant you know it's always in a loop when you try mm -hmm. to make something mm. We miss the days where you actually do the workshops all together, like in your images, you know, in a, in a tent and then everybody gathers, you know, using all the machines together and sharing. Um, I hope that day how, comes back, <laughs> you know, having the workshop you, on site together. How do you do with model makings and things? It, it was all done individually. Post COVID, it was yeah. It wasn't a workshop. Workshop. It wasn't that much of sharing the the ownership of making. It was all individual. To be honest, it was all separated. Yeah, that's you know often becomes model making becomes like you know trying to show off or trying to show mm -hmm. how how well you can make things. But I think mm -hmm. it's it's way more. Than uh, it's very important yeah. to actually make things and you just look into it and take mm. pictures so i you know it obviously it's sad you can't show people and then people are easily stru struck by beautiful models but you know <laughs> yeah, i would say <laughs> keep on doing that without even people seeing it i think it's a very interesting way of pursuing forms mm. yeah right Thank you very much, Kanto. We will gather um, questions from students and then send it okay. to you. It might be a long list of Excel file. <laughs> How do I answer that? Should, should I show up again or? Uh, no, you can just fill it out. My question form, like answers on, on, the, on the side row. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just type it in. Okay. That would be it. Okay. Oh. Thank you very much. Hope Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kanto. Bye. Have a lovely weekend. You too. Yeah. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.